members. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm honored to be the journalist in residence here for the next two and a half months. And it's a great pleasure to me to talk to you today. So I'm based in Munich, Germany. What is us, you probably know, is on another continent. But coming here to KITP feels more like coming to another world to me. And that's why I choose the little prince as a guideline to go through what I want to tell you. Uh, who knows the book? Who has read it? Well, most of you know it. Uh, I make it a very short introduction to the book for those who haven't read it. Uh, um, the author is uh, Antoine de saint exupéry he was a French author and pilot, uh, born in 1900, and he died in 1944 at the end of the Second World War when his plane was shut down over the Mediterranean. saint exupéry had worked as a pilot in Argentina and Africa, and the book is about a pilot as well who has to bring down his plane in the desert and he's very busy fixing it. He's in a hurry because he hasn't got any water. And out of nowhere, there comes a little boy who asks a lot of questions and never stops before he gets an answer. And so I think this is quite an analogy to the world of journalism that is also far, far away. And like the little prince planet is very far away where he's coming from. And it's a very strange planet as well. And uh, what Lars mentioned already, please feel free to ask questions. I will also try to ask you some questions. And maybe we get into something like a dialogue. Uh, the dialogue will not start today. I think this is just the start. And hopefully we'll have a lot of nice conversations and maybe some workshops on one issue or the other. Um, so the little prince comes from this strange planet where he has got three volcanoes that have to be cleaned every day. And um, the question is, why does he go away? I mean, I like my place also in Munich, but we both went away because we are very curious about other things that are happening. And we both ask a lot of questions. Um, I've been dreaming about becoming a science journalist uh, since I was a student. I had read a book uh, from a German professor called Heinz Haber, who was uh, writing about the evolution of the universe. And I thought that was fascinating stuff. And I thought, that's, that's what I would like to do. At that time, giant science journalism was a profession. Um, yeah, not, not very popular. Not many people did that. Uh, so I started writing for a newspaper while I was still a student. And after I had made my master in geology, I went into the publication business. I worked as an editor first and later became a freelance science writer. I was uh, reporting for a series of popular science magazines in Germany, like Bildwissenschaft PM, uh, also for radio, uh, Bayerischer Rundfunk and TV. And I also do uh, a popular science, uh, customer science magazine for a German research organization. It's actually uh, the biggest European research organization on applied technology, Fraunhofer, based in Munich. And in 90, uh, in, oh no, I don't remember the name, uh, the, the number. In, oh yeah, in 1991-92, uh, I was uh, taking part at the Night Science Journalism Fellowship at MIT. Okay, so that was a short introduction to my history and my world. And uh, maybe what I also should tell you is that I'm not a physicist. I told, or, I told you already I'm a geologist, but I'm not specialized on geology either. I have a very broad field, and I covered a lot of science and technology in my life, from the Big Bang to the history of pasta. And uh, so name it, I've got it, but I never went too deep. But during my talk, you will see why that is. Okay, so 
when I was thinking about how to tell you physicists about uh, science journalism, I thought, yeah, maybe I have to go a little bit into words you understand. And I was thinking about science journalism and figured out there are different forces that make this world spin around. And they are actually, I named them strong and weak forces. Uh, the strong forces being the things that drive the editors and the audience. The editors always think they represent the audience. And the strong, the weak forces being how journalists think what they have in mind if they talk to you. After I have introduced you to these weak and strong forces, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the history of science uh, journalism, reflecting, I'm making a shade here, right? uh, reflecting uh, what people or what a broader audience feels towards uh, science. And uh, in the end, I want to figure out uh, what all that stuff could be, yeah, could mean for you or how could you could use it. So let's come to the first strong force. That's the news. News is something everybody likes, everybody's interested. Imagine in the old age, people were asking the neighbors uh, or the travelers that came around what the news was today. You might open up a newspaper or you look it up uh, in the internet or uh, you listen to the news on the radio. Um, so news is a driving factor in journalism, always, always has been. And uh, journalists are always looking, digging for something that might be new and interesting to their audience. Like the little prince who looks for a great view up there, the journalist is looking for great news. So the question is, what could be news in science, right? I mean, we're talking about science communication here. So I brought an example for you. You all know that. So the news was the Higgs boson was found. Uh, the question I want to ask you, why on that day? What do you think? I guess there were scientists working for a longer time. I mean, that's normal. Why? Who was it? It was done because of the conference in Australia, I guess it was. Yeah, right. CERN made a press conference, right? Mm -hmm. It was a yeah, press conference. Yeah, they wanted to announce it so that the experimentalists could speak at that conference right? about okay. it. OK, so it was sort of planned, right? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So that news was planned. The CERN made a press conference. They published it. They told it to the journalists. And then it was the news. So you see, PR can work very heavily on that on that issue. Uh, I brought you another example. I, this is a little, uh, I'm still not very familiar with the American system of making copies. So this is sort of glued <laughs> together. Um, but we had that last week, right? So this was uh, satellite uncovers bonanza of black holes. Uh, that was a press conference NASA gave, obviously. So the PR business is very strongly engaged in making news. Everybody wants to break news because that brings them to the front page. I mean, is this just something that is obvious, but it is good to, just to have it in mind. So news is something that has to happen today. So if I plan a press conference or some outcome of some way, um, I um, I have to do it that day, the next day. It might be covered, but then it's history. Then a feature might come up or a background story, but the news factor is gone. Uh, so that was a new finding. What else could be news? Well, let me ask a slightly different question. So you know, some journalists don't like the sense of being manipulated by the press releases from a university or from a scientist. Because that's, of course, what we're intending to do, is to get the journalist to write the story based on the press release. So maybe you're going to get to that, how, how you as a journalist view the press releases, which is the scientists or their institution trying to generate news by doing a press release rather than 
another mode in which the journalist actually thinks of, it's of interest and decides to write a story well, independent of a press release. Yeah, the journalist would, of course, like to have it earlier. Yeah. So um, this is always a question of policy, how, how an organization deals with that. I mean, if they have decided they want to put it on the news or do the press conference on that day, they will probably not give it to you a day earlier. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, this is an, a, a very broad field. How do you interact between PR, interaction between PR and journalism? I always had the impression that it's a little bit different in Europe than in the US. That was my personal feeling. Uh, that what you just mentioned, uh, uh, American journalists are extremely careful with taking information that is sent to them from some PR person. My impression is that in, in Europe, this is happening, yeah, there are less concerns. That does not mean that they just use the press release. Yeah, they do their own story, but they might just need, use the information. So the concerns are obviously a little bit. Does that answer your question? Hey, can we understand what you're asking? You're asking what is news? Yeah, what else could be news? What else could be news? I think there two different kinds of news that could come out. One is short collaboration, few authors. They, you have the freedom. You can contact the authors, you can, you know, because normally we publish first on the electronic archive, which is completely open. You could, many journalists actually go and visit some of these archives regularly, they contact the authors. But I think the big collaboration papers, just such as the Higgs boson, is, really released I mean, after lots of internal reviews, it becomes news, it becomes newsworthy more than anything else, after it has gone through a lot of process. So they can't give it to you because they themselves, it, even though it's being discussed maybe for even a year, they are not sure that what the outcome is, what the final statement is, yeah. because it has, been, it has to be agreed by probably 2,000, 4,000 people. Yeah, right. So that's a very difficult process. So it's a process, so, yes. So the question is, what is newsworthy? What exactly is the statement we will make? Yeah. And you can see there were a lot of caveats that was put when the Higgs boson was announced. Right. Now, I, I was just asking what else. I mean, what came in my mind, some new findings, some scandal, uh, scientists lied and said something wrong yeah, yeah. or something like that, that would also be news. I suppose so. I mean, journalists should definitely expose uh, certainly, uh, what is it, bogus science and uh, science that is manipulated just for the purpose of news should also be exposed. I guess. Yeah, that, that could also be the case. Uh, maybe some money has been given somewhere, some big grant, somebody has won a big grant or so, that would also be news. I'm just pointing out things that could happen to you and you might think I could use it. This is just the idea. Uh, also some local events, like somebody holding a speech at a university that might be interesting for the local newspaper, just to invent them. Sometimes this starts an avalanche, like bigger newspapers picking it up. So I think if you are interested in this, this sort of business, just think about how the news, is, is there any news factor in it? Yeah, so that would be, okay. So. The second strong force I want to talk about is the story. While the news was something that's really happening on one day, the story can happen any day. So what could be a good story? So I just ask you, I don't ask you now as scientists, but as readers or consumers of media. Why would you like to read a story? Sarah. The, the, everything in a story that has uh, captures your imagination, just mm -hmm. as the the, simple, the obvious story is the curiosity. That had all the elements of a narrative. It had suspense. It had drama. It had um, excitement, visuals. It had potential for good and bad outcomes, and human beings uh, involved at every level. So. Uh, uh, that's obviously a story that would hit the news. So a, 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 a person and feelings and emotions and something cinema in my head. Something at stake. <laughs> something going on, yeah, imagination. 
Any other ideas? What would you interested be interested in when you open a magazine? Why, why would you read a story about science or technology, in, not in your field, but in general? I think it's general, what is it, uh, enhancement of overall knowledge that, that not necessarily in our own field, maybe it is in biology. Knowledge, like you learn something more? You have yeah, more? you know more about the universe. OK, yes. Maybe the implications? The implications? Huh? The implications of that? Oh, the implication, why I would need that? Yeah. In particular, answering a question that people really care about or are right. fascinated by, for example. Yeah, right. Any more suggestions? Okay. But let me check what I found. <laughs> yeah, emotions. I also found the emotions, the big questions. Something I haven't known before. Something thrilling, maybe and unexpected. Okay, so th that would be about what a good quest, uh, what a what a good story would be. I think good stories were always something people liked. Yeah? In the old age, they were sitting around the fireside, and today journalists uh, are the experts for telling stories. But the interesting question is, how do they get these stories? I mean, sometimes you read really good science journalism, and you think, how did they get it? They, they just didn't walk into this institute here and see the people sitting there and have their story. So it, it must have come somewhere. So the instrument to get the story is ask questions, like the little prince, ask a lot of questions. Yeah? And eventually, you will step over something that's really interesting, unexpected, whatever the scientist might have done something when he was a little boy that brought him to that dimension or whatever. So it's, it's just a process that has to, that takes a lot of time and just uh, sit together and talk, and sometimes helps. So be prepared when you enter this world of the media, you might be asked a lot of questions, even personal questions. Americans are more used to these personal questions, I think, because the newspapers start covering, uh, start the stories always the way that there's somebody, a person involved. Europeans are a little bit more stiff in that way. Uh, they don't like to answer personal questions, what how they drove, or what the friend on the phone said. So I have a question in this regard. You mentioned that you have a broad range of interests. Now, to recognize whether something is interesting, one needs some background knowledge, is my prejudice. So as a journalist that covers many fields, you well, and probably don't have in-depth knowledge of all those fields, how do you decide what is interesting for you? Uh, well, it, the, the journalist has in his, in his uh, head, in the back of his head, he has his editor. So at the moment I, I hear something, I scan in my head whether that might be interesting for one of the editors I'm working with. And if I have the impression, OK, that could be a story, then I start thinking about it and asking more questions, whether that's really new or not, or uh, exciting in a scientific way. I is, it, is it really the editor that you uh, care about, or the audience, actual audience? Well, actually, the editor pays my bills. I know, I agree. <laughs> so, it's basically but, the editor I have to think about, but the editor thinks that he's speaking for the public. I interesting, yeah. Okay. The question is always, is that right? But I don't, I, I mean, personally, I don't care too much about that, but... Uh, so, of course, I think I should say I think about the audience, but the audience doesn't pay the bills. But I will come back to that later. <laughs> so, but your question is, I mean, uh, regarding whether I could say this is something really thrilling or interesting, I can say it might be for the audience of that magazine. Um, but I have to ask you for the science, right? Is that science really interesting? You have to answer that question before I start or you would have to answer the question. Does that give you an answer? No, not really. But, but you can't talk to many people. So there is some kind of a selection filtering process on your part, right? You must be reading something and say, oh, OK, this sounds interesting. Yeah. And then you contact the authors, or do you contact the editor? First? Right. You contact a scientist, or the author of the paper, or I will come back to that later, how uh, it usually works. Um, Okay, um, we, 
we're asking for, digging for the story, right? So the third strong force is the impact. So one thing one of you mentioned uh, already was, is it interesting for my life? Does it have any impact on, on, on my personal circumstances? So it turned out that in, within the last years, more and more stories were about the impact. Um, in the earlier days, I will come back to the history of science writing uh, in a minute. Uh, in the earlier days, uh, there was more writing about some science is interesting in general. Today, a lot of magazines really want the impact, what has to do with history. Uh, but that means that it's easier right now, for example, medical articles like new drugs or so that are good for everybody because a lot of people know somebody who's got Alzheimer or whatever. Uh, so the impact stories turn, very, turn out to be very often about medicine and biotechnology. So it has become a little bit harder for other sciences. For applied uh, science and research is also a little bit easier. And I brought you an example that is from Fraunhofer. What is sort of this, uh, yeah, everybody can use it, impact uh, examples that had a lot of coverage. Uh, that answers you for the The largest human organ. It is a sensory organ that protects our bodies and is integral to our metabolism and immune system. For the past few years, this important tissue has been grown successfully in the laboratory using tissue engineering methods. But only in a costly, labor-intensive manufacturing process at specialized laboratories by trained personnel. Until now. In 2008, biologists and engineers from four Fraunhofer institutes joined forces to create a project that is truly unique in the world, a factory for human skin. Initially, we wanted to show that we can produce test systems where human tissue can be used as an alternative to animal experiments. Because many studies have revealed that drugs tested in a clinical trial may cause side effects in patients that did not appear in the animal experiments. The skin factory consists of three fully automated modules. In the first module, the equipment separates skin cells from a piece of human skin the size of a postage stamp. A laser beam measures this biopsy. Then the sample is minced by a small blade, allowing the individual skin cells to be extracted. But who would actually need artificial skin models like these? The initial target group for whom we developed this device includes companies that are involved in cosmetic, chemical and pharmaceutical development and that rely on the use of tissue for both risk assessment and impact analysis. At the beginning of module two, the isolated skin cells are filtered out so that they can proliferate. This process of cell division can be easily detected under the microscope. The cells are dividing here at the top in the highlighted region. In order to stimulate propagation, the cell cultures are placed in an incubator for about two days. A robotic arm regularly retrieves them so that cell growth can be examined and tracked. Depending on the growth, each dish receives its own special diet through a pipette. Despite all the technology, it's not the equipment that sets the pace, it's the biology. So the system must be able to respond flexibly. Über dieser Anlage angeordnet, quasi als 
almost like a fourth module, the software running on this system controls the whole process and acts as the interface for the user. This is by no means a rigid process. Instead, we have processes that hinge on cell growth. In module 3, the cultured skin cells are placed on a gel matrix. The skin tissue is able to grow here. Mixed well with collagen, within about two weeks, each of the small plates holds a full-grown, three-layered piece of skin, just like human skin, with the epidermis, dermis, and subcutis. At the end, each of the 24 virtually transparent pieces of skin in the dishes has undergone a fully automatic quality control process. Even when it was just a prototype, the system met all the hygienic standards of good manufacturing practices. The short-term goal is to develop cartilage and skin with blood vessels. In other words, skin that can also be used directly as transplants for patients. The major advantage is that we intend to produce autologous transplants from the patient's own cells. We start by taking a small biopsy from the patient, isolate and expand the cell type of interest, and build a patient-specific transplant. Ultimately, this means the patient can give up long-term medication therapy. The risk of rejection is eliminated, and the lack of donor organs is no longer an issue. In the future, such skin and tissue factories could be installed at major medical centers where they could grow replacement organs for patients. Okay, so that was an example for an impact story that was, <coughs> yeah, had a little science in it, it was sort of entertaining. Um, you might think basic science has not much uh, to deliver in that way, but still journalists do write a lot about uh, fundamental research, uh, like if it has to do with cosmology or it has to do with the universe. It always breaks the news and the question is why. So I found a force, force, force strong force for you and that is the search for fundamental answers. So this is a little tricky, and I think this professor here with his funny graphs shows how complicated that can be. I don't think that the little prince understood a lot when he met this scientist on his planet. Uh, but there's always the hope somehow of the audience that scientists might answer the big question of how it all started and where it will all go and what's the meaning of life. And so these stories that are involved in that uh, get a very good circulation because people like to read it. So it's just curiosity and Hope that uh, yeah, one gets a little bit more. <coughs> I brought some examples uh, from German popular science magazines. Yeah. Actually, re returning to your previous picture, if I remember correctly, uh, this particular gentleman, the little prince, he could not get his science published or accepted because he was um, wearing a funny hat and that was viewed as uh, uh, you know, being a serious scientist and uh, then finally he changed to a more European style of dress, and then uh, suddenly everybody was accepting his science. So right, right. Uh, that, that, that actually brings up the, the, the question of whether um, this mode of uh, journalism, where um, journalism is only done, or largely done, science journalism is largely done based on press releases um, that are coming from, you know, let's say, large collaborations or from big institutions that have already accepted and decided to support some particular piece of science, that's the only thing that sort of gets into the public domain. No. And, uh, uh, you know, the, I mean, you know, you certainly wouldn't, for example, if you were doing political reporting, right, you wouldn't want to only report on politicians who give press conferences, right, you would want to do some investigative journalism. And so the question is whether, whether there is room for, for that in, uh, uh, in science reporting as well. Oh, I, I, uh, may I just flip back a little bit for you? Uh, because that was an important question, I think. 
I left the news business long ago, see? So that was the first one. It had the news. But all after that was not news. And it had nothing to do with press releases. The story, story uh, sure. style that could be a feature or reportage had nothing to do with news business, neither with press conferences and PR, right? And the impact stories are not based, they can be based on a news piece, but they don't have to. And the fundamental answers usually don't come in a press conference. I wouldn't expect them to be there. Well, is it true? Is, sorry. Is it true that uh, I mean, uh, this I was told by a friend of mine that uh, write a lot of uh, very popular books uh, of science. That, is it true that if you want to sell, a good, make a good selling on the book, you have to put a god in the title? <laughs> that probably helps. I mean, it was a god particle. It sold quite well. Uh, no, it probably helps. I just had uh, personally made the experience talking to German publishers that right now they don't want to print any popular science books at all. So they say they, they're sort of the, uh, the, the circulation went down and uh, the end of the boom and they had so many and right now it's very difficult to sell anything. So it's probably a big help to talk about God. But Even if it doesn't, if it's not the central topic, I mean you, you need... <laughs> that's, that's exactly the point I wanted to make. Yeah. It's often a promise yeah, exactly. that we give you we give you the last, uh, the unlösbaren Rätsel der Schöpfung, so the, the last miseries of, uh, of uh, creation, were probably not solved in that uh, magazine, right? <laughs> but um, they promise you something. So the, the, the godlose world, the, the godless world of Stephen Hawking, I don't know whether he's so godless, but anyway, the, it, it made the title, it made the front page. So I think your friend is right. Put something on the front page that really sounds like you will get uh, the last misery solved. And uh, unfortunately, it works that way. I mean, I personally don't think that this is great. Yeah because it's sort of scandalizing everything and uh, it, it probably comes to on hold after a while when you have a reader that has a hundred times read that the last mystery is ever solved. So what are effective ways of conveying something that we're truly interested in but without having to sensationalize in this fashion? Uh, find a way to tell a story that People like Sarah mentioned before, their curiosity is uh, is uh, is uh, how do you say awoken? Can you say that? Um, that that something is happening, something thrilling, something unexpected, something they want to know. Yeah, so that's find a way. If there is one, I mean, sometimes it's really very difficult. There are probably things. So the, the news journalists who are trying to cover the economy very rarely write straightforward stories about the economy because people go to sleep after the first paragraph. So they write stories about individuals, stories, human stories yeah. that, who are, that are themed and based on an experience and a, a philosophy they're trying to explain within the economy. So they start with a story and work backwards to capture the human element. It could be that some fundamental science has to do the same thing in some way to capture the reader first. Right. Find some way in the story. Okay, uh, I go ahead a little. Okay. Um, so uh, I know from my experience as an editor, this this kind of titles always sell quite well. So that's the reason the editors use them. Uh, so now we come to the weak forces. Um, so that's what the journalist has in mind. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of things uh, I would like to tell you that it might be a little bit easier for you to understand. Uh, one is, I mentioned already, that the journalist always has the editor on the back of his head and his audience. So this is sort of a triangle that is interacting in a way. And uh, the, the audience needs it usually, if it's a lay audience, needs it usually quite simple. So it's very important to, uh, to explain what you have to explain 
uh, in a way that is easy to understand. And uh, always have in mind that this journalist is living on a very small planet like the little prince that is uh, pushing around his chair all day and that's how he can watch the sunset all day, that's uh, that graph. Um, so the, the journalist might need it very simple and he might not need it into too big detail. So uh, he doesn't want to see the brightness of the star in full extension. He might need just a quote. He might need just a short explanation. So it always depends. OK. So after having introduced you to the strong and weak forces, I would like to dig for the fundamental laws in the media galaxy. Um, the, there are in that media galaxy there are different objects drifting around. There's the TV planet and the newspaper planet and radio planet, the, multi, uh, the social media planet, and all have their own rules. And to entertain you a little bit, I have a short piece for you how TV uh, news and coverage is made by Charlie Brooker from the BBC. I found that very entertaining. Before long, a standard news report visual language established itself, one that's immediately recognizable to anyone. Me has this report. It starts here with a lackluster establishing shot of a significant location. Next, a walkie-talkie preamble from the auteur, pacing steadily towards the lens, punctuating every other sentence with a hand gesture and ignoring all the pricks milling around him like he's gliding through the fucking matrix. <laughs> Coming to a halt and posing a question. What comes next? Often something like this, a filler shot designed to give your eyes something to look at while my voice babbles on about facts. Sometimes it'll slow down to a halt, turn monochrome, and some of those facts will appear one by one on the screen. This is followed by the obligatory shots of overweight people with their faces subtly framed out, after which the report is padded out with a selection of lazy and pointless vox pops. And um, usually get some inane chatter from people. I don't want some punter's opinion you say. No. Another bit of dull visual abstraction to plug another gap now before the report segues gracefully into a bit of human interest courtesy of some dowdy man opening letters in a kitchen and explaining how he's been affected by the issue. When I'm watching the news, I don't really, you know, there's a person talking to me telling me what's going on and I don't really listen to what they're saying. It's just news. It's just news. He, unfortunately, was boring, so to wake you up, this is an animated chart, this is a silhouette representing the average family, and this is a lighthouse keeper being beheaded by a laser beam. <laughs> As we near the end of the report, illustrative shots of pedestrians and signs and a pipe at a window, and then the final summary ending on a whimsical shot of something nearby, accompanied by a wry sign-off. If you're lucky, a bit of wordplay fit for a king, or in other words, a regent's treat. Charlie Brooker, Newswipe, London. <laughs> <laughs> so you enjoyed it, okay? <laughs> well, unfortunately, sometimes it is it is that way, yeah. Um, but no matter whether we talk about the TV planet or the radio planet or the uh, uh, the uh, the newspaper planet, they are all based on uh, on a. Uh, they are all based on some laws, and that is uh, they have to make money. Either they have to get funding, or they have to sell ads, or they, have, they need a very big circulation. It all comes down to the point that without their audience and without the money, uh, there is nothing. There are no stories, there are no news. So there is an interaction between the public that buys it, and the people who give the funding or give the ads and, uh, and the stories. And this interaction uh, means that only things are selling that meet the expectations of the public. And while the expectations of the public is changing, also journalism is changing. So that happened during history. And I want to make a very short uh, run through history now. 
um, showing how that interaction has changed. So when science journalism became a profession uh, around the second and f uh, first and second world war, um, science was something that people admired. They had great expectations. So the scientists were dealt like, uh, yeah, dealt with like talking to heroes that had a great message to give. Journalists were in a very devoted uh, position. And uh, that attitude, think about the time when you read about the space race or the first man on the moon or the atomic bomb. So those were really big things. Uh, and in the 60s, there, that still continued, but there was a, a different way to approach the issues coming up uh, that was uh, pushed by a more critical uh, generation. Uh, like I, I just say, would say, it was in Europe the, the 68 generation, and here it probably was the anti-Vietnam hippie generation. Uh, more critical science journalism came in addition, and that went on for a while. The, the critical journalism was very much concerned about environment and what all these uh, science would do to humans and their environment and the pollution discussion started there. And so this, these two ways to approach science went together for a while. And I think it's, it's a little bit hard to say when, that, uh, when there was a change. There was a change, definitely. I would say that just incidents, like in the US, it was a Three Mile Island accident. In Europe, we had the Chernobyl accident. The English had uh, the mad cow disease. Those were incidents that people started to get very concerned. And we're starting to say, oh, that, that can't be. We, we don't want that kind of science anymore. So they became more critical, more concerned. And the newspapers reacted by covering these things a lot more than they had before. So the, the science section boomed, and the radio and TV uh, channels brought more science stories. So there was a big interest in science. And it became a, a profession. Uh, a lot of people went into science journalism. And that, uh, with, with all these, the golden age, uh, golden age of science journalism had started. Uh, behind it stood the idea that the independent press had to control this science. So that was the idea. Um, the reactions were different. I mean, in Germany, for example, uh, research institutions and foundations put money into educating scientists that wanted to go into science journalism. So the education was changed. Uh, the idea behind that was that they wanted scientists in the business who did the reporting. Uh, I think that was a little bit different here in the US. Uh, there are still a lot of science writers out there that do not have a degree. So this was a little bit a different attitude. When you cover a science story, do you always try to get a confirmation of it? I mean, it political stories, they always try to get a confirmation, not just in, one in, source. Inform, uh, confirmation, you mean different sources. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's part of the journalistic uh, uh, tools, yeah? that you should ask different people about I, their opinion. I don't see that all the time, but if no. I think that should be built in, especially if you want to make sure that what you're reporting is authentic and... Yeah, actually, I just I just read an article of uh, that is a, a, a book about a conference about science writing where, where they discussed that. Uh, point is uh, that um, sometimes very often, no, put it the other way. Very often, journalists get the idea to write something from uh, from a scientific journal, so it's probably peer reviewed, and um, so they just summarize it, or uh, they call the scientist and ask you, could you maybe talk to me about that that research? 
I mean, if it was peer-reviewed, it's not, sort of a little bit artificial to call another scientist who is maybe not even working in the field and say, what do you say? Um, that's a little bit strange. So very often, journalists just think, well, if it's peer-reviewed, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes they don't have the time to do it, and they just take one side. But I'll give you an critical. example. Not, not always journalists report only peer review thing. I, I, I was telling you that articles appear on some electronic archive, yeah. and journalists pick it up. It's not a peer review. Okay. And they try to report it. And, and it. and in those cases, it's extremely important to have independent view of what is being written, reported. Well, it could be, for example, that the journalist doesn't have the insight. He doesn't really know that this is a, a point of debate, that there are other scientists out there that do not know, uh, that, that have another opinion that might be. But, well, the easiest way is to go there, look at the references, list of references, pick up the names that have been cited in the references, right? And then talk to one of those who you think is, is, is the best. I yeah. think. I can good. get an independent view. That's but a, good. a lot of this now, I mean, but, you know, maybe 15 years ago, there was a science reporter at Nature who was independent of Nature because they have a firewall between their, at least they did then, between the reporting and what was appearing in Nature. And he he had a clear list of people he would call, and he would yeah. just call every three months and ask, what's up? What's happening? Yeah. He would find stories. Right. He was a real journalist. Okay. He was a real journalist. <laughs> but you mean that these stories were not going out to be press release? No, no, no. He would actually find what was happening in science and write stories because he was an investigative journalist. Okay. But I think most places can't afford to have someone yes. like that on payroll. That's right. Yeah. Right. And um, but it was amazing the things he would find because he would he would do what you'd expect. He would call around and he would and he had his network and there were some people who developed relations with and as any good reporter would. Right? But I, I think there's no resource for that level. But some that. reporters, I mean, they, they call me up and they say, okay, they're asking about my work, and then they say, can you please suggest me a few names that so I could talk to? Well, I, I might give bias name. I mean, I might give names of people <laughs> whom I know will say nice things. Of course, but they can the journalist knows that. The journalist knows you're going to give them that. That won't give you, the journalist another perspective. Yeah. But, but, but what, what Lars just mentioned, I also have a network. I, if I work on a story, I call those people first because I know them. That's right. I work with them since many years. I say, could you please just review the article I have read or give your comment? What do you think? Yeah. So this, of course, but this means that I do have a network and the connection. I know these people personally, and they like to have a coffee with me or whatever. Yeah. So because they do me a favor, yeah, it takes them half an hour from their precious time. But they know, right, that that one time in five years when they have a story, that they're going to be able to probably work through you, whether you like it or not, to get the story out. Yeah, some some want it, some don't. So. No, I understand, but, that's, that's but, but uh, do you have some examples of the stories that you are saying? You know, about? Oh yeah, yeah. He, he found stories. He found stories that ended up scooping press releases from NASA. Because he found out there was a you know, result was announced at a conference that six months later the person wrote the paper in Nature, but in the meanwhile he got the story out wow. because he went <laughs> to the conference. So sure. I mean, we don't view. You know, we don't usually hold back some result. Yeah, we don't. Right. That's so why if, if there's a press person in the room, they'll. And if they're smart, they can scoop you. Sure. But those are rare. But that's very rare. Yeah. Because I think it's a it's a big investment in time. Yeah, and, and I think also in, in, in trust and to know each other. Like I mentioned, a couple of friends who would call me and say, "Oh, I'm publishing something next week." Yeah. Nice, nice that you told me. Okay, now I can look what I can do for you. But uh, yeah, it's just okay. But I will talk about that a, a little later. I come back well, to it. Too much of a little later. Yeah. It, okay. I rush well, through the rest. Okay. No a, more questions. Talk, another talk. Another, another, no, no more questions. Do okay. You don't have to do everything now. But, but it, it would be it would be too sad if I would have to skip the last three pages. Uh, okay. So uh, the uh, the boost in science journalism came to an end. Uh, uh, with the economic crisis, and uh, so the, the, the 
science section had to be cut down again. The publishers had to save money. A lot of science journalists lost their jobs. Um, in Europe, it uh, worked that way. They first fired uh, the freelancers. Then they it, it told the staff editors they have to write more. And then they fired the editors and told them they would be better off as freelancers. <laughs> and uh, so, and the rest, what was left, was shifted to other sections, like uh, the science writer ending up, one science writer out of 10 ending up in the health section or in the, uh, in the news section. And um, this is important for something I mentioned before. The editor in the news section and in the health section thinks differently than the guys in the, uh, in the science section have thought as long as they existed. They are interested in the, in the impact. They just ask, what is it good for our reader? How does it help our reader? They don't think this is a good scientific achievement. They think in a different way. And so this was the boost of the, of the impact stories, as I mentioned before. And of course, it has only uh, been a change in, um, in the, the language that can be used. In the science sections, there the people uh, or the editors thought that they can use a more sophisticated language than they do in, in other uh, sections. Okay, uh, the conclusion of all science writing is in a crisis. I choose that picture of the little prince because he is uh, next to a rattlesnake here and in great danger. But I think there is still hope. And I found hope in the book, The Little Prince, uh, on the page where he wants to become friends with a fox. So uh, maybe that's a good suggestion. Uh, that while we are here, me as a journalist and you as a scientist, to tame each other a little bit. Mm. I mean, I think we uh, uh, talked about that already. And uh, uh, just for you to know, um, yeah, that would be a good idea. And now I'm almost at the end. Uh, I want to say a couple of words uh, how I work because it, to, by talking to you guys uh, the last week, I figured out that some of you are a little scared um, because if you, somebody talks to me, it might be that the next day it is on the front page of whatever paper. I can promise this will not happen. Um, I just tell you how I usually work, and that might make give you a relaxed feeling, and we can enjoy our cookies and our tea together and just chat. So uh, I work usually in a way that I talk to people. Uh, and if I get an idea, uh, I always filter these things I hear and think whether an editor or the public could be interested. And then I write or I call my editors, but I would let you know before I do that, if you were involved. And once the editor gives his go and I start writing, I would get back to you and ask you for more information so you would realize that as well. And before I send it out, I would double check my facts with you and give you your quotes so you are on the safe side with me. Uh, but of course, mistakes can always happen and I want to entertain you with one last cartoon. Are you able to read that or shall I read it to you? Who cannot read this? <laughs> You're done with that? Everybody done? Because there's a next page. Everybody done? Yes. <laughs> okay, I didn't think I have to explain that. That's fine. So, things like that happen. I. I would. I, I have the idea to ask you how you, as scientists, think you can avoid it, but maybe we need another talk on that. Um, uh, or do I have two more minutes? Sure. Two more minutes. Okay. So, how do you think you could avoid that? 
I mean, I told you how I avoided by double checking and double checking and double checking, and getting back to the people. But what do you think? Choose your reporters carefully. <laughs> Choose a reporter? Okay, what else? Does it help to supply uh, uh, text bytes to report or paragraphs that you formulate yourself that they can incorporate in the text to get the message accurately? Or uh, well, in, in my case, it wouldn't help. Maybe you find a reporter that is working that way. I, I think first you have to make sure the journalist understands what you're talking about. I mean, if he really understands you, that might help. So choose your words. <laughs> Simple. But really understand is a relative concept, right? I mean, he doesn't have your background, so he or she would not understand it in the sense that the scientist uh, is understanding it. So in, I guess without double checking every word that's written, you as a scientist will not be able to say, yes, this is OK or not, right? Unless you see the whole piece, you're not able to give it your OK. Or well, can't you do just that? and read yeah. the whole piece before it goes out. Oh. Couldn't you have an agreement well, that? Well, I think they won't up and reading the whole that. piece is one suggestion. Yeah, that depends very much. Uh, a lot of journalists I know do not do that. I that, that know for editors for that month. are, uh, that say they forbid it. Why? Because there are legal problems. Um, I don't know how you to express that in English, I have to admit. I well, the U.S. is the same. Some, some reporters will let you see the board, yeah, others some, won't. Some what, what type of legal issue? It's not a legal issue here, it's a sense of uh, independence. Mm. Well, it's legal and independent. And that seems to be more rare that they will actually let you see it. Wisdom. But from my point of view, this is hard to understand. I mean, if you report something that I work on, without me being able to check the final thing, I mean, Suppose you, despite the best efforts, misrepresent it. Uh, and then my colleagues read this piece about my work and they say, what the hell, are you not able to, you're not able to explain what you did to the journalist? I mean, well, I think, I think we first have to agree on, on the audience. If the audience is your colleagues, yeah, then I agree with your concerns. Uh, the question is, who is the audience we are writing for? Yeah, but you have this image that you're objective. Yeah. If, a, if there were a politician right. who was being interviewed, would you allow them also to edit the copy? And then a lot of reporters take the same attitude toward a scientist as they would with a politician. They must write what they hear without review. Uh, I, I didn't mean, I'm, I'm gonna, was not concerned about the judgment of how important the stuff is that I'm working on, because certainly there will be different issues about that, but at least that the, the results are pro, um, reported accurately or, or discussed accurately. I mean, this I think, I, I need, need to see the final piece else. Well, I think we need definitely another session on that one. <laughs> I'm to ask the reporter before they leave, and presumably you'll do this face to face over the phone. Can you explain what I told you back to me? Yeah. And yeah. Say just you know, you know, what is your if if you had to get an elevator talk or what I just told you, which is presumably what they're going to do. What is the bullet point that you just took away and make it up? They're not going to a public. Most of the stuff we really care about, the big press releases, the Higgs boson, the the way that's condensed is enormous information compression, uh, and we would. And often by analogy, many of which we will find many things to nitpick with. Um, so, it, it, and that sometimes has to be done. You know, how do you explain the Higgs boson in one sentence? Um, but what the reporter takes away from whatever conversation they have with us is probably the one thing that we can at least ask them to do. And I think they would. Would you feel that's? Does that come across as condescending if we ask? So, so now that we've had this conversation. What do you think were the key things that I just told you, and what do you think you're going to highlight in your story? Yeah, right. Is that too much to ask? Is that too no, much? no? I think I think that's fair, and I, I mean, that a, a journalist should agree on that. I mean, you you can make that clear from the beginning, saying I only talk to you if you tell me uh, what you want to make out of it, or give me another call once you're done with that, that I get an impression. But if, if you put too much pressure on it, so I, I'm, if, if I'm not allowed to read your thing, then that might be the end of it. I mean, to, to be honest, yeah? I think yeah. that's called good communication. I mean, in any conversation, 
if you're not, you know, if, you're, if it's a one-way street and you're you're just dumping, you're doing a brain dump on somebody, whether it's a reporter or you know your your spouse, you're not going to get back, you know, what you think in, in the end, right? <laughs> yeah, because I think uh, assuming that the journalist is a good journalist, then you have to assume that you're talking to a different audience than the one of your colleagues, as also Marty was saying. And I think uh, you should try to communicate as much as possible well with the person and make you, you know, well understand, uh, like politicians will do. No? Yeah, well, I think that that's a good point. You have to think about the audience first, right? Who yeah, is but that? I, I respect journal, the journalist's independence. They have to report it. Sometimes it will be bad, but that happens in all fields, all reporting. But, well, right? but I know the problem. The only problem is you, you might say it is associated with me, but you know maybe it is my, authored by the journalist. It's not authored by you. So maybe my comments came across. Uh, too strongly. I did not mean to distrust the journalist. I mean, I uh, understand they are professionals too, and they do the best they can. But the notion that I will not see at all before it goes public what is written disturbs me. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, that it handles differently. But if you, if you, if you deal with the editor, the, the reporter could write a great piece. The editor takes it, cuts it down to right. you know a fraction of what they wrote. Yeah. You, can't, you can't have to say on that. At least I would have to, like to have the option to say, I think what you wrote there is a little bit iffy. Could you please modify it? I don't want to prescribe how it's modified, but just to give an opinion. OK, I think I would love to come to the last slide now. That would be, uh, how could you use all this information? I see you are already in it, so this is wonderful. Um, so I choose the, uh, that picture for a takeoff. So the, the little prince wants to go to another place and you might just go into the world of the media or it might happen to you, for example, because a reporter calls you or uh, somebody asks you for an interview, so you might not even have planned it. Or you might have planned it because you need some PR for some reason, you need funding or whatever. And so uh, how could you make your own PR, your own business? How could you get into the world of the media? So there are different ways to do that. I mean, that's just the other way around. We discussed it until now. That's like you could make a press release and or ask your PR officer if you've got one to help you. You could put something on YouTube, or you could make a podcast. Uh, you could call a journalist you know and use your personal contacts. Uh, no matter what vessel you use for that voyage in the world of the media, it can be a lot of fun. And I hope that we keep this conversation going and have a lot of fun until I'm, I'll be here probably longer than you guys, <laughs> until Thanksgiving. And my room number is 1202, it's up at the end of that hallway on the other side, and I'll be happy to discuss with all of you about your personal uh, questions or about science journalism in general. Thank you.